At this time, WGN uh, joins the Mutual Network for the presentation of the All-Star Game, which is in progress at the present time. Theo DeRocher, who will guide the destinies of the National League All-Star team this year, has for outfielders such game-breaker-uppers as Mel Ott, Joe Medwick, and Pete Reeser. Pete Reeser leading the National League in hitting with an average of 361. And these men are fortified by such stalwarts as Zena Slaughter of the St. Louis Cardinals. Young Willard Marshall, freshman sensation of the New York Giants, making the all-star team even before he's completed his first year as a major leaguer. Then there's Terry Moore, pretty good with that willow and considered as one of the finest defensive center fielders in the history of the game. And then there's Danny Litweiler of the Philadelphia Phils. In the infield for the National League, there's Archie Vaughn, who hit two home runs in last year's All-Star game, you remember, hit them in succession. And when he had hit his second one in the National League ahead, it looked as if Archie Vaughn would be the hero of the 1941 All-Star game. It took Ted Williams' ninth inning home run, which won the game for the American League, to rob Archie Vaughn of being the hero of the 1941 Midsummer Classic. Then there's Jimmy Brown of the St. Louis Cardinals, a switch hitter. That's right or left, depending on whether a right-hander or a left-hander is pitching. Always a dangerous little man up at that plate. Eddie Miller, at shortstop, who hits a long ball. Frank McCormick of the Cincinnati Reds, another long ball hitter, and a good hitter. And, of course, last but certainly not least, one of the biggest power men in the major leagues, Johnny Mize, who's become very fond, incidentally, of those short right field stands here at the polo ground since he's become a member of the New York Giants. The distance from home plate to the right field stands, 294 feet. Not a very long distance, and John has learned how to pull that ball closely, which you have to do to get them into that right field stands, and is very fond of them. There's a 100-foot drop away from that 294-foot sign as the wall out there fades away toward deep right field to the uh, bullpen. It's a 100-foot drop, so that in order to get that ball into the right field stands, you do have to learn how to pull them closely. The men back of that plate for the National League is tonight can hold their own with a bat, too. Walker Cooper, Ernie Lombardi, and Mickey Owen. And as for pitchers, looking at it from a defensive standpoint, what more could you want than such men as Morton Cooper, Whitlow Wyatt, Claude Passo, Johnny Vandermeer, Bucky Walters, Ray Starr, and Carl Hubble have been added to that list since Cliff Melton, who was originally scheduled to perform for the National League tonight, came up with a sore arm. Morton Cooper's won 11 games. Whitlow Wyatt has won eight. Claude Passo has won 12 games. Johnny Vandermeer has won eight. Bucky Wallers has won nine games. And Ray Starr, a veteran sensation of the Cincinnati Reds, a veteran from a standpoint of age rather than service, has won 12 games. That group of pitchers, all in all, have won 52 games while losing only 26 among them for an average of some 667, and that's pretty good pitching. Morton Cooper, who's scheduled to start for the National Leaguers tonight, has appeared in 16 games for the Cardinals this year, has won 11 of them. He pitched 134 and two-thirds innings, allowed 88 hits, walked 37 men, and struck out 71. And in his string of 11 wins, there have been six shutouts. So if he certainly, if he performs up to par this evening, it's going to be perhaps a little bit too bad for those sluggers in the American League lineup. Of course, that is strictly conjecture. It remains to be seen. Looking at the starting lineup for the National League, Jimmy Brown, who leads off and will play second base, is a switch hitter. And, of course, with a right-hander, Ready to go against them, Spud Chandler of the Yankees. Jimmy Brown will bat left-handed. Leo DeRocher, as a matter of fact, has, for his first six men in the lineup, all left-handed hitters, playing that percentage angle of a left-handed hitter against a right-handed pitcher. Brown, Vaughn, Reeser, Mize, Ott, all bat left-handed. The first five hitters, I should have said. Jimmy Brown has a batting average of 267 to bring into the ball game with him. Archie Vaughn hitting at 262. Pete Reeser will bring into the ball game an average of 361 on the season. And Johnny Mize has come up over the 300 mark, hitting at 301. Mel Ott hitting at 261. Joe Medwick, who follows, hitting at 344. Walker Cooper, who will catch, hitting at 286. Eddie Miller batting at 270. And these boys are pretty good in the matter of home run production, too, to give you an idea on their slugging propensities. Jimmy Brown has had only one homer. Pete Reeser has six. Johnny Myers, the National League leader in that department, has 14. He'll be followed by Mel Ott, who has 12 home runs. And, of course, Myers and Ott are very, very accustomed to these stands here at the polo grounds, this being their home lot. Between them, they've hit 26 home runs this year. 
Joe Medwick has three home runs to his credit. Walker Cooper, four. Eddie Miller, four. So that the first eight men in the lineup for the National League have accounted for 44 home runs between them this year. And the matter of runs batted in, to give you an idea of the hitting strength of this National League team, which in the past has been noted especially for the defensive uh, propensities. Uh, Jimmy Brown has batted in 43 runs. Archie Vaughn, 23. Pete Reeser, 38. And Johnny Mize has driven in 63 runs this year, leading the National League in that respect. Mallott has driven in 44. And Joe Medwick has driven 55 runs across the plate. Walker Cooper, 26. Eddie Miller, 25. And so with the first eight men in the lineup, they have accounted in runs batted in this year a total of 317. So all in all, you can see from what Jim Britt has told you and from my brief analysis of the National League lineup, the two teams tonight are pretty evenly matched. And one team cannot be said especially to have any advantage over the other one way or another insofar as pitching, defensive strength, or offensive strength is concerned. So what we shall see will be a game in which the cream of the crop in the major leagues, pretty evenly matched, will go to it in this 10th meeting of the National and American League All-Stars. All right, here's Bob Elson. Thank you very much, Mel. Well, friends, from what uh, my two colleagues have told you, Jim Britt and Mel Allen, you can gather that uh, this is going to be quite a ball game. We have two evenly matched squads here tonight, and it should really be a swell game. We're going to pause now for station identification. We're happy to say that our mutual stations from coast to coast have set aside their time, canceled programs with the cooperation of sponsors, so that the mutual broadcasting system could bring you an exclusive presentation of one of America's greatest classics, the All-Star Game. You're listening to the broadcast from the Polo Grounds in New York City. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Well, friends, here we are back at the Polo Grounds in New York City. One thing we wanted to tell you about was that the ball game tonight cannot run past 9.10 New York time. Uh, there's going to be a test blackout in New York tonight uh, at 9.30. So the ball game will not run past 9:10. If because of any circumstances beyond the control of everyone, there should be no ball game tonight, this ball game would be played here in New York tomorrow afternoon at 1:30, and the Cleveland game would be played in Cleveland on Wednesday night. In the event that something should prevent this broadcast tonight or this ball game tonight, it would be played here in New York uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1:30, and then the Cleveland game would be set aside, or would be set back just one day. In other words, we're anticipating a game in Cleveland tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, and don't forget that your mutual station will bring you that great game, and boy, that should be a classic. From that huge bowl at Big Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, your mutual station will bring you the story of that game tomorrow night at 8.45. Now, I know that someplace across the country, there might be some of you fans who are tuning into our mutual broadcast late. Uh, the game has not started as yet. There's been a delay uh, of a bit here, and I'm going to run down the batting order and line up again slowly for you. Some of you are perhaps keeping a scorecard on this ball game, and so we'll give it to you slowly in their teams. So those of you who want to keep an actual card, an actual rundown of the ball game, will have plenty of time to get it in. Let's take the home team first, the National League team. Jimmy Brown of St. Louis, second base. Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn, third. Petey Reeser of the Dodgers in center field. Johnny Mize of the Giants at first base. Mallott, the manager of the Giants, will start in right field. Medwick of Brooklyn, and by the way, Medwick has really been playing marvelous ball for the Dodgers this year. I think that Joe's comeback, uh, although it wasn't exactly a comeback because he played good ball last year, but his the baseball he's played this year has really been something. As you know, he's right up there hitting around 345, has driven in a flock of runs. He hits safely in a long stretch of ball games, and Joe's having another great year. Uh, Medwick will start in left field. Walker Cooper of the St. Louis Cardinals will catch. Eddie Miller of the Boston Braves is going to start at short. And Morton Cooper, the ace of the St. Louis Cardinals staff, who's won 11 ball games and lost three, uh, is going to start for the National League. By the way, looking over Cooper's record, we see that he won 11 games and lost three. He pitched 12 complete games. And one thing you notice about Cooper's record is that he pitched six shutouts. Martin Cooper has six shutouts out of the 11 games he's won. Now turn around on your scorecard, and here is the American League starting lineup. Lou Boudreau of Cleveland, the manager of the Indians, will start at shortstop. 
Boudreau at short. Tommy Henrik of the Yankees will start in right field. Henrik, H-E-N-R-I-C-H, Henrik, right field. Williams of Boston, left field. Joe DiMaggio of the Yankees in center field. As I told you before, little Dominic of the Boston Red Sox is laid up with a bum back and he's in uniform but will not play in the ball game. So Joe DiMaggio will bat fourth and play center field. Then Rudy York of Detroit will bat fifth and play first base. Gordon of the Yankees, second base. Kenny Keltner of Cleveland, third base. Bertie Tebbets of Detroit, that's T-E-B-B-E-T-S, Tebbets will catch. And Spurgeon Chandler of the New York Yankees, a right-hander who's won nine ball games and lost two, is going to pitch for New York. There were three uh, fans, there were three late uh, switches in the uh, rosters today. Uh, as you know, Paul Derringer uh, was laid up and could not uh, take part in the ball game. And we also had another late uh, withdrawal from the ball game, and that was Melton of the Giants, their outstanding left-hander who had a sore arm and couldn't come into the ball game, and so. Uh, there were two other pitchers nominated, and they are Carl Hubble of the Giants, who's down here in uniform for the National League, and also Starr, the great right-hander of the Cincinnati Reds. He was also uh, nominated uh, in place of Paul Derringer. Uh, the other nomination concerned the American League squad, and that was that Bill Dickey uh, dropped out of the lineup, and Wagner of the Phillies stepped into his spot. Wagner, as you know, is a catcher, a left-handed batter, and a very good hitter, and he stepped into Bill Dickey's spot. Bill has been ailing for a couple of weeks, hasn't been in the Yankee lineup I don't think at all until the Boston series, and uh, he's not well enough uh, to get into the ball game. And Wagner has taken his spot. Uh, the umpires, when the ball game gets underway, will be Ballenfant, B A L L A N F A N T of the National League, back at the plate. This is the National League game. This is the National League is the home team. At second base will be Barlick, B A R L I C K of the National League. At first base will be Stewart of the American League and at third base will be McGowan of the American League. Now there you have the pitchers, uh, there you have the umpires, uh, there you have the starting lineups and the squads. Al Shack, by the way, is just uh, walking uh, back from center field. He's coming out here toward, uh, toward the infield and the crowd's giving him a hand. While we have time, let me tell you something about this Polo Grounds layout. It's a complete double-decked affair. Our mutual broadcasting booth is in a swell spot here, right back the home plate where we can see those balls break in over the plate. It's in a great spot to see the ball game. And there's a complete double deck all the way around the park. Uh, this has often been referred to as the left-hand hitter's paradise because it's just a short poke down that right field line. As I look down that line right now, I can see the mark is around 290 feet, which isn't very far for a good left-handed pull hitter. It's a little bit farther, however, down the left field line. It's a poke of something like 330 feet and from there on out into left center field to deep center field to right center field, it is a real wallop. Uh, in fact, it's one of the longest drives to the center field fence of any ballpark in the majors. It's something uh, from here to the center field wall is something like 483 feet, and that is really a wallop. 483 feet to the center field wall, so you can tell what a poke that is. The only, uh, the only spot where the hitters get a break in this park at all, I really think, are down this right field line. Of course, that is the left-hand hitters, those pull hitters, <laughs> who can pull that ball uh, into those stands, which uh, are only 290 feet distant uh, here from the home plate in the ground. There's been a, an unavoidable delay here in the uh, start of the ball game. It hasn't uh, gotten underway as yet. Right below me here is the American League squad. I might tell you, too, that all the American League players are wearing their home team uniform. Uh, the American League teams are the uh, visiting teams, so the American League players are wearing their road uniforms. And right below us here, below our mutual booth, a little bit to our left, uh, is the Yankee team, or is the American League team. Joe McCarthy, who just recovered from an unfortunate illness, is back. I talked to him today. He looks in good shape. He said, Bob, we have a great squad this year, and I think we're going to beat the National League again. Uh, Joe is all set right in the pink for this ball game. I also had a chat around noon with the fine manager of the National League squad, Leo DeRocher, who's done such a splendid job with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he said uh, to me, Bob, we've got the best National League team that we've had in years. This year, we not only have National League pitching, but we're going to show those guys some hitting, too. And as you can see from the figures that uh, Mel Allen has given you on the National League, uh, the National League team this year does carry a lot of power 
and anything is happened to have to happen in this ball game uh, when it finally gets underway. When there is going to be a delay, uh, circumstances beyond our control are going to delay the start of this ball game. And so we're going to leave you here, take leave of you now for just a little while. Stand by, however, we'll be standing by in our mutual broadcasting booth here in New York, ready to bring you this ball game, the all-star game, play-by-play, -play, just as soon as the ball game starts. So just stay right with your mutual station, and just as soon as the all-star game gets underway, uh, we'll bring it to you. And so for just a while at least, this is Bob Elson saying goodbye to you from the polo grounds in New York City and returning you to our New York studios. Our program service will continue in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Stay tuned to WGN for the broadcast of the All-Star Game between the American and National Leagues, which will begin shortly from New York City. We rejoin the Mutual Network. How do you do, baseball fans across the country? This is Bob Elson talking to you again from the Polo Grounds in New York City. And we're all set now for Mutual's exclusive coverage of the 10th Annual All-Star Game. You hear that announcement through your radio? That's the public address announcer here in the Polo Grounds in New York City calling the official batting order and lineups around here to the people in the stands. He just completed it, and now I'll give you the rundown again for those of you who might be tuning in late. Here is the starting lineup for the National League, and the National League team will very shortly take the field. And then Jim Britt will describe the first three innings for you. Mel Allen of New York will describe the middle three, and I'll describe the last three. Uh, the announcer has just called the official batting order and lineup. I repeated it to you before. There has been an unavoidable delay, and the ball game is going to start now any minute. And here is the lineup. For the National League, Brown of St. Louis at second base. Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn at third base. Petey Reeser of Brooklyn in center field. Johnny Mize of New York at first base. Mel out of New York in right field. Joe Medwick of Brooklyn in left field. Walker Cooper of St. Louis is the catcher. Eddie Miller of Boston is the shortstop. And Morton Cooper of St. Louis is the pitcher. His record, as we told you before, he's won 11 ball games and lost three. Uh, 11 of his wins have been shutouts, and he's been one of the outstanding pitchers of the year. You stop and figure 11 wins and six shutouts, you've got something. Here's the lineup for the American League. Uh, Cooper has just come out of the uh, National League dugout, which is down here to the right of our mutual broadcasting booth, and he is going to warm up now with Ernie Lombardi. Ernie Lombardi of the Boston team, he's going to take a few throws, and the rest of the National League team is out on the field just tossing the ball around. Not on the diamond, they're on the field. They haven't got out onto the diamond as yet. And uh, Cooper is going to try a few practice throws from the mound. He's walked out to the center of the diamond now. And here is Big Ernie Lombardi of Boston, who is one of the reserve catchers for the National League, uh, standing just back of the plate taking Cooper's practice throws. Uh, here's Spud, Spud Chandler of New York, who's going to start for the American League. Uh, he's come out, and he's going to get a few practice throws. Well, let's get on anyway with the American League lineup. Lou Boudreau of Cleveland, shortstop. Here's another announcement. Officials contacted Mayor LaGuardia, who gave permission to carry this ball game until 9.30. As you know, if you were listening to the broadcast earlier, there is a practice blackout here in New York tonight at 9.30. Uh, they had established a time as a deadline time on the game at 9.10. In the event of a tie at that time, the ball game was to have been played tomorrow. But because of an unavoidable delay, the uh, baseball time has been allowed to run until 9.30. So the ball game will run until 9.30. Now, let's get on, shall we, with that American League team. Uh, Lou Boudreau of Cleveland is going to play shortstop, and Lou's really been having a grand year. Uh, Spud Chandler is also out there getting in his practice throws. He's standing in one side of the pitcher's mound, and Walker Cooper of St. Louis, or Morton Cooper, is on the other side, and both pitchers are warming up from the center of the diamond. Uh, the teams are not on the field. The players of both teams are along the playing field uh, on the side of the foul line side, here to our left and to our right. Lou Boudreau at Cleveland, I think, is having one of the greatest years of his career. Not only has he done a splendid job with that Cleveland ball club, he's really revitalized that club. He's had them playing great ball. He has the respect of his players, and he has been playing the best ball of his career. I talked to him in Chicago when the Indians played a series there with the Sox last week. 
And uh, Lou played wonderful ball. And uh, talking to some of the players on the Cleveland Ball Club, I know that uh, his year so far at Cleveland has been a howling success, even though Cleveland's not in first place. So Bedro will start it short. Tommy Henrik, the dependable right fielder of the New York Yankees, is going to be in right field tonight. The alternate was Dominic DiMaggio, who they had intended starting. But in yesterday's uh, doubleheader, the Boston doubleheader, uh, Dominic hurt his back. And although he's in uniform here tonight, he is not going to start in the ball game. In left field will be Teddy Williams. Yesterday in Chicago, I talked to Eldon Auker, who's won 10 ball games this year for St. Louis, about great hitters. Auker told me that in his judgment, and he's pitched in baseball many a year, Williams will go down in history as one of the five greatest hitters that ever lived. I asked him what was it that made Williams such a great hitter. And he said, Bob, the thing that makes Williams the great hitter that he is is the fact that he can hit these kind of specialty pitches like knuckleballs, sliders, and sinkers and all that sort of thing right when they're in their motion. In other words, when a knuckleball comes in and starts its particular motion, uh, Williams can hit that ball right when it's in that particular motion that makes the knuckler famous, and he can drive that kind of a ball out of the ballpark. So those specialty pitchers not only don't fool him, but he can time them, and he can hit those specialty pitches, and not only hit them, but he can drive them out of the park. And Auker told me, and uh, he's a pretty good pitcher and a pretty good judge of hitters, that he thought that Williams would go down in history as one of the greatest hitters that ever lived. Now in center field is Dominic DiMaggio. The great DiMaggio, the famous Yankee Clipper, has uh, gotten off to a rather slow start this year. But uh, he's been coming along. Uh, his throwing hasn't been, for one thing, as good this year as it has been in previous years, nor has his hitting been as good. Seeing uh, Joe DiMaggio batting around 270 doesn't look like Joe because you'd expect to see him up around 350. But Joe just hasn't been able to get going at his regular clip. Of course, uh, Yankee fans and the Yankee bosses figure that Joe will get going. He's been in a slump before. But anyway, he's one of the greatest ball players in the game, and he'll be in center field. At first base will be the big powerhouse to the Detroit Tigers, Rudy York. No, he's not exactly the outstanding fielding first baseman in the American League, but he can knock him down. He can get in front of him. And what is more, he can really powder that baseball. Yes, sir, that big boy can really sock that ball, and uh, his big bat will come in handy in that American League lineup tonight. Now at second base is one of the greatest ball players in the game, Joe Gordon. If there's anything that uh, a great second baseman should do that this fellow cannot do, I don't know what it is. I was talking to one of the greatest men in baseball, Connie Mack, last year. Mr. Mack told me that he thought that uh, uh, Gordon was one of the greatest second basemen he'd ever seen, and that was enough for me. At third base will be Kenny Keltner, the outstanding third baseman of the Cleveland Indians. The catcher is going to be Bertie Tebbets. Here's an announcement. It's about the test blackout. If you couldn't hear the announcement, the uh, public address announcer was telling the fans that the uh, blackout, the test blackout here in New York tonight is going to start at 9.30. And the ball game had previously planned to end at 9.10, regardless of what stage the game was in. But now, because it's been late getting started, they're going to run it down to the actual blackout time. And the customers and fans here in the stands have been asked to remain in their seats. Gotten as far as the catcher, Bertie Tebbets, who's going to be back at the plate in place of Bill Dickey, the old workhorse of the Yankees and one of the greatest catchers in the game. Tebbets is a fine catcher and he's a good hitter and the pitcher tonight is going to be Spurgeon Chandler a very fine right hander of the New York Yankees who has had a fine record this year the uh, pitchers in the American League are Chandler Bonham Ruffing Benton Newhauser Euston Bagby Hudson and Eddie Smith the pitchers for the National League are Martin Cooper Whitlow Wyatt Carl Hubble Passaw Vandermeer Walters and Ray Starr of Cincinnati there's been two changes. Melton drop, was dropped off the squad today because of a sore arm, and Carl Hubble was substituted. Derringer was also out because of an injury, and Starr of Cincinnati was substituted. There was one substitution on the American League squad today, and that was Bill Dickey dropped off, and Wagner was substituted. And now, fans, we're all set for the uh, All-Star game. The teams are going onto the field. The umpires are coming out. The 10th annual All-Star Ball Game is going to be brought to you exclusively by the Mutual Broadcasting System. The umpires have just walked up to the plate. The National League team has gone out onto the field. And I'm going to turn our microphone over now to my good friend Jim Britt of the Yankee Network, who will talk to you just as soon as you hear our national anthem. Thank you. 
Good evening again, everyone. This is Jim Britt about to bring you the first three innings play-by-play -play of the 10th All-Star Game. As you know, the previous record is six victories for the American League, three for the National Leaguers. And at the moment, there goes the official starting ball being given to Morton Cooper. The rosin bag has already been handed him by the Brooklyn Bat Boy, who is the home bat boy for the National Leaguers, just as the Yankee Bat Boy is the host of the evening as far as the visiting American Leaguers are concerned. Walker Cooper is the catcher, and his brother Morton Cooper is on the mound. Recently, on the occasion of an Army-Navy relief game at Braves Field in Boston, attended by more than 25,000 fans, Morton Cooper came within two bloopers, two accidental base hits, you might say, of pitching a near-perfect ball game. In addition to that, he gave one walk. That was his third consecutive shutout. Later, that streak was broken. Here is the starting plate umpire, Lee Ballenfant, coming over to talk with manager Joe McCarthy of the New York Yankees about some matter pertaining to the game itself. At first base will be Ernie Stewart of the American League. At second base, the colorful Al Barlick of the National League. And at third base, Bill McGowan of the American League. The first man up will be manager Lou Boudreau of the Cleveland Indians. He bats right-handed, has a season's batting average of 302. This is his first year as a skipper, the youngest skipper the American League has seen. He has seven doubles, seven triples, and a single home run since the start of the season. He is one of the most famous athletes in the history of the University of Illinois. He was a great basketball player. His opponents in the Middle West, especially in the Western Conference, insist to this day that great as he is in the diamond world, he was an even greater All-American cage star. There's the roar as Boudreaux, who has quite an unorthodox batting stance, starts his position. Artie Fletcher is coaching at third base, and at first base is Bucky Harris, the manager of the Washington Senators. Boudreaux crouches. The outfield is just about straight away. Here's the first pitch, and it is ball one. One ball and no strikes the count. The infield is back on the left side. Archie Vaughn is playing just about five feet away from third base. The outfield is fairly deep on the left side with Joe Medwick playing deep in the corner. One ball, Morton Cooper winds up, delivers. There goes a long drive towards left field. That ball is given a real ride, and it is up in the stands for a home run. The American Leaguers lead one to nothing. was the first home run ever hit by Lou Boudreau in an all-star game. It was a long drive that went to left center field at around the 400-foot mark. It was a tremendous wallop off right-hander Morton Cooper and the American Leaguers lead by a score of one to nothing. Portsider Tommy Henrick is up now. Here comes the pitch, and he looks at the ball low and outside. That is the second time Lou Boudreau has driven in a run in all-star game competition. The score is one to nothing in favor of the American League as a result of his walloping a tremendous homer to left field on the very second pitch thrown to him. The score, one to nothing in favor of the American Leaguers. One ball to count on Henrik. Here it is. Too low. Two balls and no strikes. A tremendous roar came from the throats of the assembled fans here at the Polo Grounds. That would have been a home run in virtually any baseball park in the league, in either league, including Washington's Griffith Stadium. The outfield is just about straight away for Tommy Henrik. Right fielder Mel Ott is fairly deep. Here's the pitch. Call strike. A nice pitch just buckle high through the heart of the plate. Incidentally, Martin Cooper, like Higby of the Brooklyn Dodgers and Paso of the Cubs, is a jinx-defying hurler who wears the numerals 13 on his back. Paced by Boudreaux's home run, the American Leaguers have nobody on in the top of the first. Nobody out. And the count is one and two. Outside. Ball three. Three balls, one strike to count. Cooper is a tall, swarthy, extremely handsome right-hander who many of the Cardinal rooters believe is another Jerome Dizzy Dean. His record so far this season is 11-3, and three, and his streak of nine consecutive victories was just broken. He winds up, pitches. There's a foul ball down the third baseline, fielded very easily by third base coach Artie Fletcher, who flips it to Archie Vaughn. Vaughn is rubbing up the ball. He takes a few steps over toward the infield grass. And Morton Cooper is standing out on the edge of the mound waiting for it. There is one of the American leaguers making a slow trek from the giant dressing room here at the polo grounds over towards the left field bullpen. The count is three and two. The big one just about ready to sail up with Tommy Henrik, the New York Yankee right fielder up. Here it is. There goes a drive that goes solidly into right center field for a hit. 
Henrik pulls up at first base, rounds the bag, decides to go to second. There's the throw, and he has a double. Center fielder Pete Reeser came in to slow the ball up. It didn't quite have the power to reach him. It was right over the head of second baseman Jimmy Brown of the Cardinals. Henrik rounded first base and very smartly decided that he could take two. He went all the way to second base, hit the dirt, and the play was not close. That is Henrik's 18th double of the year, by the way, but it doesn't count as far as his 287 batting mark is concerned. Thumping Theodore Williams of the Red Sox is up. That was Henrik's second RBI. Strike one called. Williams looked at the first one, which Morton Cooper threw just about chest high, right over the heart of the plate. Williams has a batting average of 348, 18 home runs so far this year, 80 runs driven in. He spread eagles both the major leagues in the power department. The American Leaguers lead one to nothing. Henrik on second. Here's the pitch. High and outside, one and one. Bucky Walters is warming up for the National Leaguers out in the right field bullpen. Morton Cooper has already faced two men. Boudreau hit a tremendous home run drive into the left field stands at the 400 foot mark, and Henrik doubled to right center. He hit the dirt with a nice slide going in. One and one the count on Williams. Henrik leads off. Here it is. There goes a long drive to left center field. Medwick is going deep for it, waiting, and he takes it. There goes Henrik tagging up. He draws a throw to third base, which is good, and he goes back to second. Williams hit a long fly ball to left center. It was taken by Medwick. And here is Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio, the Yankee Clipper, whose all-star record is not star-studded. He has a batting average of 268. Many observers believe that this is the night he is destined to break out into full all-stardom. Low and inside, ball one. Tommy Henrik is on second base with his illustrious Yankee teammate, jolting Joe DiMaggio, standing in that famous wide base of his at home plate. He's waving his bat in the direction of Cooper. The outfield is deep to the left. Medwick has backed up. He is just about as deep as Ott was in right field for Williams. One ball to count. Here it is. Strike call. A good strike. Through the heart of the plate, buckle high, and the count is one and one. One man out. The American Leaguers, one run. The National Leaguers, nothing. Lou Boudreau hit a home run on the second pitch. Then Tommy Henrik doubled to right center. Henrik is still anchored at second. He takes a lead. Cooper pitches. Inside. Ball two. Strike one. Joe was all set to tee off on that. Had it appealed to him, he doubtless would have swung from the heels. But he choked his bat and got out of the way. He and his brother Dominic and his other brother Vince stand with their feet probably wider apart than any other trio of batters, certainly any brother combination in the majors. Two and one the count. There goes a high bouncing ground ball to Archie Vaughn. He holds the runner to second, throws to first. There's the throw to first base for the out. And Henrik, after the throw was made from Vaughn to Mize to retire DiMaggio, took third. Archie Vaughn did his job. He tried to bluff Tommy back to second base. Tommy did not go all the way back, realizing that Vaughn would have to commit himself. And just as soon as the long throw was made from Vaughn Demise to retire Joe DiMaggio, Henrik took third on the out. Two men out. Bucky Walters is still warming up, by the way. And big Rudy York, chief Rudy York of the Detroit Tigers, is up. He is the first baseman. He bats one below the cleanup slot. Has an average of 278, including 14 home runs. Henrik on third. Two men out. Ball inside. That one very nearly shaved the letters. Detroit, right off the front of Rudy's chest. He wears the number four. All these players, you know, are wearing their own uniforms. The National Leaguers, their home uniforms. The American Leaguers, their traveling suits. One ball, no strikes. Two men out. Henrik stands in foul territory, just a little off third. Here's the pitch. A swing and a miss. One and one. Rudy swung from the heels on a handle curve ball that came through fast. The infield is back on the left side. Eddie Miller, who has played in 39 errorless games going into this one tonight, which will not count against his National League fielding record, is a deep shortstop. The outfield to the left. There's a drive that goes towards right field. A long drive, and that ball is going in for another home run to make it 3 to nothing. Rudy York is coming home, back of Tommy Henrik. He's being congratulated by Joe Gordon. The American League leads three to nothing. And Rudy York, who is a notorious center field and left center field and left field hitter, hit a home run straight away into right field for his first all-star run batted in 
his 15th home run of the year. He has 14 through the regular season, and the score is 3 to nothing as Hendricks scored ahead of him from third. Flash Gordon is up. He has an average of 347. A swing and a miss. Flash went up there ready to swing on the first one. The American leaguers are threatening to turn this into a first inning route. Two mighty home runs, one to left by Boudreaux, one to right with one on by Rudy York, each hitting his first round trip wallop in an all star game. Two men out, none on, Gordon up. The count is one strike. Cooper pitches. There's a swing and a miss. At a chest high curveball outside, and the count is two strikes. Morton Cooper so far has been no puzzle for the American leaguers, but the game is young. With eight and two thirds innings still to be played, it is anyone's ball game. Two men out in the top of the first, nobody on. Gordon has a mark of 347, bats right, waits, swings and misses for strike three. That's the first strikeout of the 10th All-Star game. But the American leaguers pounded Morton Cooper savagely in the first half of the first inning. They collected three runs on three very solid hits for a total of 10 bases. There were no errors, and of course, there were no runners left on base. Now in the event you tuned in late on Mutual's exclusive play-by-play -play report, of the 10th All-Star Game from the Polo Grounds in New York, the proceeds of which are to go into the Baseball Equipment Fund and to the Army and Navy Service Relief Societies. Here are the lineups again. For the American League, manager Lou Boudreaux of the Cleveland Indians, shortstop. Tommy Henrick of the Yankees, right field. Ted Williams of Boston, left field. Joe DiMaggio of the Yankees, center field. Rudy York of Detroit, first base. Flash Gordon of New York, second base. Ken Keltner of Cleveland, third base. Bertie Tebbets of Detroit, catcher and Spurgeon Spud Chandler, whose record is 9-2, and two, a right-hander on the mound. For the National League, Jimmy Brown of the Cardinals, second base, Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn, third base, Pete Reeser of Brooklyn, center field, John Mize of the Giants, first base, manager Mel Ott of the Giants in right field, Ducky Medwick of Brooklyn in left, Walker Cooper of the Cardinals, back of the plate, Eddie Miller of the Boston Braves at shortstop, and Morton Cooper of the St. Louis Cardinals on the mound. He already has been shelled savagely, to the tune of three runs. The score is three to nothing in favor of the American leaguers. Here comes Jimmy Brown, who is a switch batter. He will bat left-handed. With Spud Chandler on the mound, he has a batting average of 263, including one home run and 14 doubles. Here's the pitch. That ball hit him right in the small of the back, and he takes first. Jimmy Brown had no opportunity even to get out of the way of an inside curveball that broke very sharply, hit him in the small of the back, and he becomes the first National League base runner in the All-Star Game of 1942. Archie Vaughn is up. Archie has a batting average of 270. He bats left-handed, one on, nobody out. Chandler pitches. Inside, ball one. Bill McKechnie is coaching at third base for the National Leaguers. Frankie Frisch of the Pittsburgh Pirates is coaching at first. One ball, no strikes. Here's the pitch. There's a ground ball that is hit to second baseman Gordon. Gordon to Boudreau. One out. Boudreau to York. Double play. With a count one ball, Archie Vaughn lashed a savage grounder that went straight as an arrow from a bow to Flash Gordon. Gordon wheeled through to Boudreaux, who made a magnificent pivot to throw to Rudy York, who made a good stretch to get Vaughn ahead of the relay. Two men out, nobody on. Pete Reeser, the Major League batting champion of the moment at least, with a batting average of 361. A left-hand batter, two men out and none on. It knocked him down. Ball one, close to the head. Pete went down, now he gets up, brushes the dirt off his trousers. Spud Chandler is scraping the dirt together on the mound to make more comfortable that pace of his that he takes towards the plate. He has gotten rid of two men. His teammate, Joe Gordon, started a twin kill. Here's the pitch. Low and inside for a second ball. The American leaguers have a lead of three runs to nothing on the strength of a home run by Lou Boudreau and a home run by Rudy York after Tommy Henrik had doubled. Two balls, no strikes. There's a slowly topped ground ball that goes to Gordon. Gordon flips to York, and the side is retired. Chandler did not retire the side in 1-2-3 order, however. He hit Brown with a pitch. Vaughn smashed into a Gordon to Boudreaux to York double play. And then Reeser hit an easy roller to Joe Gordon. Gordon came in fast and smothered it on a slow hop and threw to York for the out. 
No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left in the last half of the first inning. And there is a little band music to celebrate the fact that the American Leaguers have been the first to score. They'll show no partiality through the course of the evening, however, because there'll be just as much in the way of celebration on the part of the National League fans here tonight. The National League, by the way, is the host of the evening. Artie Fletcher is coaching at third base. He's the celebrated Yankee coach, signal stealer, and third base coach par excellence, who has aided Joe McCarthy and his Yankees to so many world championships. Coaching at first base is Bucky Harris, the manager of the Washington Senators, the former boy wonder. The coaches for the National Leaguers are Bill McKechnie and Frankie Frisch. The respective managers, of course, are the two men who matched strategies and tactics in the World Series last year at Yankee Stadium and Ebbets Field, Leo Jarosher and Joe McCarthy.